Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a new episode of Iblis Manifestations podcast. I'm honored to be joined by the great Silenos on this episode. He is the guitarist, a founding member, as well as a composer behind a Norwegian band, Dimu Borgir. Dimu Borgir are a band whose magnitude of accomplishments leave them with no need for an introduction necessarily. Uh, I could try and sit here and label them symphonic black metal, heavy metal, whatever. I think that's irrelevant. What matters is the 30 year legacy which they have left behind and that is all. And uh, Silenos and I, of course, got to discuss that on this episode. I should also mention that he is the guitarist and composer for the Norwegian death metal band Insidious Disease. Once again, another very unique entity of its own, musically speaking, and one that you cannot really easily compare to many other death metal bands. So if you haven't heard of him, I highly recommend you to check them out. On this episode, we got to discuss, as I mentioned, the third year legacy of Dimmu Borgir. We got to talk about their uh, show at the Spectre, as well as uh, the gig in Wacken in 2011 and 12 with the, uh, with the symphony that they got to perform with and what were some of the logistics behind that. And as the conversation got deeper, we also got to talk a lot about the meaning of things such as legacy. And most importantly, we got to talk about the meaning and the definition of freedom and living life on one's own terms. With that in mind, there's not much more that I wish to spoil about the conversation uh, that uh, him and I had, but I can assure you it was extremely rewarding and it was really a pleasure of mine to have him on the podcast. If you are new to the Iblis Manifestations podcast, first of all, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on here, and if you happen to be new to the channel, then uh, by all means, once you are finished with this conversation, feel free to check out some of our previous episodes, and of course, if you do enjoy the content, then please consider subscribing, as it really does help the channel a lot, more than you would think. In addition to that, my band Trivex recently released an album titled Illowa Burns Out. This album came out via Cold Never Dies on the 29th of September and is now still available for streaming. If you like your black and death metal straight to the fucking point, with a sprinkle of melancholy and depth and hatred, then this is perhaps the album for you. So be sure to check it out. And of course, if you do enjoy it and wish to support us, then you can visit our Bandcamp page, all of the links for which will be down below. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let's cut to the chase. Without further ado, please welcome Silenos to Iblis Manifestations. then Sven or the mighty Selenos welcome to Iblis Manifestations man what a what a privilege to have you on the podcast I've been really looking forward to this one uh, how have you been doing been doing good man and thanks for having me on yeah it's it's my pleasure I should probably say to everyone who's listening that uh, you know uh, surprising to myself we actually ended up uh, working to get alongside each other a couple of months ago uh, I didn't expect that that you were going to be there. So this was at Cosmic Void Festival, and uh, this was for uh, Slagmar's uh, set, or Slagmar, I don't know what the correct pronunciation is. But it was funny because I was obviously stage managing at the Underworld, and uh, and then my bass player from Trivex, Sully, he came up to me, and then he was like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize uh, Silenos was going to be here. And me being the stage manager, and I'm quite a detail-orientated person, I'm not going to miss something like that. If you were going to be there, I would have known. So I turned to him and said, wait, are Insidious Disease playing or or what's happened? No, I should know all the bands that are fucking playing. 
And then I came around backstage, and then there you were. And then uh, Rune uh, introduced us, and I was like, oh, holy shit. But then, <laughs> obviously, um, it, we spoke a little bit afterwards. Uh, so, yeah, that was kind of a cool, unexpected thing. But uh, how did you get to actually meet those guys? And uh, and then what made you actually want to like uh, work <laughs> with them in that capacity? Actually, it goes back a few years now, because um, I was ordering um, a Harley through some friends of Runes, while okay. at the same time he was ordering his Harley at that time. So that's how we started like texting and calling and and stuff. And then obviously I got to know the other guys after a while and um, and their music too. So uh, we've been good friends ever since really. <clears throat> Right on, right on. They're a very interesting band, like the whole uh, image and, and the sound, you know, as I said to you as well, like very Thorns-ish kind of a sound as well. And obviously there actually happens to be a bit of a connection there as well, right? Yeah, I think so. And uh, I think what they have in common is that they have this somewhat otherworldly approach to what they do, you know, both the image uh, stuff and, and the music, um, which I really, really like. And uh, they have their really own sound, I think. Um, and it's uh, it's really eerie, you know, with, with combination yeah. with the, with everything. Yeah. Yeah, especially at the on the world as well. You know, I mean, it was a shame we couldn't give the drummer the specific lighting that that he needed for the goat mask. But uh, <laughs> you know, no, but I, I, th I think it, I think it turned out pretty well uh, anyway. You know, it's uh, it, it was really weird to some sometimes just see him with the horns behind. There's like oh, shit, you know. But it, <laughs> yeah. it's very effectful, you know, the way they do it. Yeah, absolutely. It's just such a unique thing, you know. It's almost like you just took some, uh, you know, the, you know. It's like you're having a bad trip, you know, and you just kind of got stuck in the middle of it and you can't get yeah, out, you know. The trip doesn't stop, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, it's like you know. This is one thing I really like um, about. Um, a lot of the Norwegian artists uh, that I've kind of come to know over the years, that there's this certain degree of uh, absurdity involved, if I may say, you know, uh, and, uh, and it, it, obviously Rune is like, he's a massive character as well, you know, I mean, I got to meet him the night before that, just after we had played at the, at the O2, and, and he was just like such a cool guy and, and everything, but there's one thing I love about uh, the Norwegians, or perhaps Scandinavians in particular, that, you know, it's like, like maybe sitting around too much and, and drinking just leads to some fucking wild ideas and things like that, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think remember. you're up to something, you know, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, obviously, we have a history with, uh, with both um, absurdities when it comes to, you know, painters and classical composers and, uh, you know, the, the history of the myths and and the folklore and and all that stuff you know uh the mythology obviously so yes if you put all of this in a blender and you add moonshine and mushrooms and whatever you know you, you <laughs> might come up with something special you know <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah and mix in some ergot to the mix as well i think it, it mm -hmm. really completes it yeah there's it, it just something fascinating about it you know that uh, i think it really makes for a, a unique export i mean you look at all of the uh, all of the great bands that have uh, spawned uh, from uh, your neck of the woods over the years, you know, especially if you want to look at like the last 30 years or, th or maybe 40, it's just like, you know, I mean, completely groundbreaking, you know, and it's changed the world of music and culture as we know it really, you know, so I always find that that's a place that I keep coming back to and kind of, you know, I you know, I do a nod and, and take my hats off, you know, to, to the export of, um, of uh, your country in particular as well. I think it's really, really powerful. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, it's, to me, it's still um, very inspiring to, to look back at the history, uh, obviously not only about uh, the Norwegian scene in general, but also, well, Scandinavia, you know, Sweden, Finland, uh yeah. and denmark with merciful fate come on you know it's like absolutely it's, it's, it broadens out a lot so um <clears throat> and then you have obviously the um, the german thrash scene american and canadian thrash scene and and you mix this together then uh you get a volatile uh 
cocktail, I think. <laughs> Volatile cocktail. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that um, analogy. Yeah, I think I think you do. Well, obviously, you know, that's what's kind of cool about it. You know, is that uh, obviously with the history of metal, you know, you got people from all over the world. You know, from like very niche places, yet all kind of connecting on on this similar thing you know on this fire you know that uh, that you kind of get get to have on here i had the uh, john from incantation on here you know and he was telling me about how they were like doing letters to all over the world in like late 80s early 90s you know and it's like you know it's, it's just such a cool thing and obviously with myself coming from iran you know that's like a perhaps more of an unlikely place where you where you're gonna find uh, some of these things you know and uh, you know and then there i was as a as a 14, 15 year old listening to Dima Borger in a country that you're not even allowed to listen to metal. Um, right. Speaking of which, you guys are celebrating 30 years of the band now. So uh, uh, tell us, like, how, how do you feel? Like, that, that, there's so much crammed into those uh, three decades. How does it feel to even be on the other side of it? <laughs> I, I really don't think about it too much uh, that it's gone by uh, 30 years because I don't have any other 30 years to compare it with, you know, but uh, right. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. um, it's an accomplishment in itself that, um, that you get to do what you were set out to do when you were a kid. I mean, subconsciously, I knew looking back at some really old photos of me, like six, seven years old in front of the mirror with the, with the fly swatter, you know, trying to <laughs> imitate, uh, in, playing guitar and stuff so <clears throat> that's uh it's basically something that's been with me ever since and uh i was set out to do that and you know uh music and metal in general uh obviously saved me from sports early on so <laughs> 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 pretty happy about that i still have my body in somewhat intact so uh yeah, yeah. no i mean it's 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 uh, it's a great accomplishment i think uh whether you looked at it i mean some people probably want us to do more uh within those 30 years but i still think it's all about the quality in front of the quantity uh mark and uh and that's that's why we also <clears throat> decided to finalize this um cover album uh thing that we've had on ice basically since 2015 where it okay. first came up that we were supposed to put all these cover songs together and and to do that, to kind of leave that uh, epoch behind us. And um, but uh, then we got sidetracked, and we started also working on songs for the Aeonian album. And mm -hmm. uh, and so this was put on the back burner for several years. And uh, so now we thought, you know, we won't make the new album out in time for our thirty years anniversary. So we got to have something at least, you know. And so we thought that okay, it's 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 a good idea to have this out now and. And uh, obviously, quite a few of our fans already have these songs on various versions of albums and stuff, you know. But um, uh, and there you can uh, get them online, obviously. So, but we thought it would be cool to f to um, compile everything on one under one umbrella, so to speak, and then uh, and yeah, just for also for the sake of our newer, younger fans that maybe would have a little tiny glimpse into what has influenced and inspired us <clears throat> since the beginning and still do you know <clears throat> absolutely yeah because there's actually believe it or not uh, I mean, i'm sure you're aware of this and perhaps this sort of feeds into the purpose of doing something like that but uh i guess the same as when metallica released uh, garage days and then there were kids that were discovering blitzkrieg from listening to that there's probably going to be some people especially in the younger audience that might know dimmu borgir and might be big fans who might not have necessarily actually listened to deep purple so i do think that there is there is definitely a value to that to obviously keeping the traditions alive but also uh, paying homage to those who came before and and paved the path, you know, and I think uh, that's uh, that's one thing that I really appreciated about you guys. Kind of like always, um, despite the very sort of um, evolutionary approach that you always had within your own music, whether it was the symphonic elements or whether it was just the production, because you obviously like grew so much and always sort of set the bar uh, with uh, with every release uh, that, that you guys were doing, uh, especially like from, let's say, like 
like a few albums in you know like you were kind of like coming out and then doing all these things that no one else at that time was really doing you know and i think that it's really cool that you always kind of went took a step back to give a nod to what was before you know whether it was with the metal art cover or whether it was uh, venom's black metal or even like burn in hell you know and like all these songs that you kind of covered throughout the years you know i, I feel like it kind of I really appreciate that, you know, and it's like, uh, it's it's the spirit of metal, you know, it's that, you know, it doesn't matter like what you believe in, like what you like, you know, we still go back to that same fire that birthed this thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I get what you're saying. And that's the good thing about, um, <clears throat> with showing um, with this cover album, we have then the more uglier and straightforward and dirty side with the black metal songs and then you have burning hell and the purple and stuff the more melodic yeah. side on the other and to combine these two you kind of get what is known demo is known for as well you know the the mixture of, of all these uh, factors and um so um yeah it's uh, it's cool that it kind of comes full circle in a way you know when when you get like uh and get to be in touch with uh, your peers so to speak and uh, so to speak and they give you liner notes and give you a pat on the back and you know mm -hmm. uh for years and years they've been like yeah Dimus done one of our favorite cover songs you know like if That's you look cool. at twisted sister then they seem to really favor our our version of burning hell in front of any other cover songs uh so that's that's like um really that's fucking awesome sort of, yeah it is it really is and uh <laughs> It's like yeah, like I said, it's it's comes full circle, and that's that's the music that we grew up with and still you know listen to to this day, you know. So it's yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, there is a, a, something really beautiful about that whole thing of when, uh, especially you're you're growing up and then obviously getting inspired by all these different bands and then wanting to pick up the instrument and then actually do your own thing. You never put yourself at the same level as those people but sometimes i think when when years go on you know and it's not that you know like every person is unique to their own you know so it's not like a competition of whatever you know but rather than you know like it's it's what dimebag said is that we're all sharing riffs right yeah and yeah. and i think there's there's something really beautiful about when you find your own footing as an artist and then all of a sudden you even find yourself having a conversation with let's say adi schneider which like maybe as a teenager just a simple thought of having that interaction would have completely blown blown your mind you know or at least that that's how i've how i was was you know um uh, growing up as well so i think there is like that really beautiful thing you know when you kind of i guess earn that spot i would say yeah and i think it's also a, a metal in general if we if we generalize it it's that's the genre that has um the most down-to-earth type of artists and musicians at least from back in the day you know because everyone started with nothing you know just like we did we we were started rehearsing in a in a bastard cold uh, warehouse you know and uh, you just did it and you didn't yeah. really have any other uh, formula than yeah let's jam these songs together whatever it was cover songs or some of our own riffs in the beginning and then you know you, you don't think of like oh let's get famous or do this and that i don't i don't i think every band pretty much from the from back in the day no one thinks like that that's not uh the aim you know so when you start with nothing then it's easier to appreciate uh everything when it comes later on absolutely and you know what i agree with you and i think that's the recipe for how quality is born because if you're starting out just because you know especially nowadays you know it's like all that you would see is let's say number of streams number of uh, plays and views like i literally had this conversation with one of my guys last night uh, because we released this music video that obviously seemed to do quite okay you know for us it it, it did really well but then and then we were talking about how oh you know if we release another one is that going to do as well and then i said 
but we're not releasing shit for views. We're releasing yep. it because it's a piece of art and it's the message that we want to send. You know, if it's for views, then I don't know, go make some TikTok videos, you know, where you're like smacking eggs over your head or some <laughs> stupid shit, you yeah. know. You yeah. know, it's like, you know, that's and then and I think that's the that's the intent, you know, it's that it's the art that comes first, you know, the same as I believe I actually heard you say this as well about the Aeonian, your your last record that to you the success was just handing the master to the label rather than you know how it was then responded to afterwards and and whatnot you know and i think that's that's really what it's about you know it's it's about the art itself you know it's the being able to successfully express yourself that's the success now whatever comes after it's kind of like a bonus really that's that's how i always looked at it and also being in an environment where you don't do any compromises. Although I'm sure a lot of people out there think that, oh, since we uh, signed to a bigger label, we had to do compromises. No, we we just laid down the law right away. You know, it's like, yeah, it might take a few years before you get the new album, but uh, they know that once that album is done, they got a great product to work with, you know? So we never gotten... Uh, never got told that oh you have to do it within this and this uh time although they obviously want us to to release albums a bit uh sooner than eight years in between each one but uh <laughs> you know it is what it is and that I, I think we could have easily kind of sold out and did another uh, done another and thrown darkness triumphant you know pretty easily mm -hmm. but what would be the point you would have one album competing with one of the albums that got a lot of fans into us in the first place and then that wouldn't be any special anymore and plus people would then say well it just sounds like enthroned darkness realm from right yeah so yeah. you can't win with people that's why you have to win with yourself and that's what i meant with uh when we hand over the master that means that it's a success for us already no matter what people will say because we are happy with it we are done with it and then it's out of our hands it's out of our control and then it lives its own life you know and it's going to live its own life after we're gone so you know, Absolutely. Yeah, man. Listen, you can't do anything in life uh, with that mindset of trying to please people, but especially when it comes to art, you know, and the whole thing of, you know, deadlines and times and things like that. At times, perhaps there is a value to that as well, but purely from a creative perspective, especially when you've already released so many albums, when you've already gone and performed live with an orchestra, which I guess was a goal and an aim for many years prior to that. When you've already done all these things, you kind of don't have to succumb to the, the perhaps the industrial side of things as much. And I think that's kind of what makes it valuable. You know, that's why when I listen to your last record, uh, or pretty much like any of the last few records, I I like the feeling that I get from it because I can tell that there's a lot of attention there's a lot of sort of delicate details that are within each song you know and also the whole idea that there's an industry around art is kind of like a bizarre thing to me as well like it's it's fucking awesome to be able to make a living out of doing what you want to do but art is not something that really conforms to the reality of the world as easily you know and it's the idea that this is this is one of my favorite sayings it's that art is like a fart. If you force it, it's probably shit. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, there's, I mean, when you write a song, it could take one week, it could take two hours, it could take two months, whatever it takes to finish that song and that album. And it's done when it's done. And uh that's that's the good thing about it obviously being uh in a band for so many years and you you can fo totally focus on 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 the art you know uh there was a, a time in our um in our history where we had to take some day jobs on the side which is fine because we all come from the working class environment so for us to get our hands dirty is nothing new you know that's not a big mm -hmm. deal but um i remember then it was it took us a bit longer to to get into the atmospheric mode of uh of create creative uh the creative mode you know and uh no matter if you if you work on the side like with a regular so-called job or or not uh, you cannot put push the button on and off you know like oh, i'm going to be creative today so let's that's not yeah. how it works you know so um and obviously getting older you you get kids and there's other uh 
things in life that you need focus on. Um, but we we have uh, never compromised, and uh, uh, we have. Um, you know, I usually say that if you want to sacrifice something, you need to sacrifice something of value, mm. not something that you don't need, right? You need to. Yeah. So we have sacrificed when it comes to obviously family, uh, mental and physical health. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff that uh, we have just sacrificed because our focus has been straight on the job. On I, w- I wouldn't call it a job because it's it's something that's invigorating to do something you look forward to do a job for me it has a negative connotation anyway so but um it's yeah uh, i'm really really proud that we have never uh wavered in our uh in our focus you know it, yeah taking some time between some of the albums sure but uh we've done it on our own you know and um no one is ever going to get to tell us what to do and what not to do and we we figured out that pretty early in uh in the start of the band, you know, that when we got a lot of flack for taking the keyboard thing a bit further, but mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to use the keyboards as, as, as a writing tool as well, mm-hmm. you know, and that's the link to, we're not going to compare ourselves with Deep Purple, obviously, but they also have used keyboards as a writing tool, you know, so you have, absolutely, yeah. you have that kind of link. And um, yeah, so this, you know, we've we've done everything on our terms and then some. You know, and I also say that uh, it's not about being uh, in the right place at the right time. Once you have to be in the right place at the right time all the time, and that includes a lot of sacrifice. And uh, and it might sound really egotistical to say this, but uh, I would probably do it again. You know, <laughs> yeah, I would do it again. I I'm listen, man. I absolutely love that. That's that's powerful because you know, like to someone else listening to this, they might think, "Oh, yeah, they did things on their own terms for thirty years," but you don't really realize what that actually takes. And then when you're talking about sacrifice, other than the term being used for one of the best Bathory songs of all time, it is uh, one of the most important things, you know, and it's it comes down to the the Saturnalian nature of the world that we live in, you know, and, and a lot of times, well, all the time, there's never a straight solution within life. There are only trade-offs. And I think you make a very valuable point saying that when you want to sacrifice something, it has to be sacrificing something that is of uh, value. And, and, I, and I totally agree with that. It's almost like th- a lot of times the universe is listening back to you. You know, it's like you make deals with it. You say, hey, I'm going to do this in exchange for that. And then you go through the process. Sometimes when people chase something, they forget that the shit that they're experiencing is something that they asked for and they complain too much, not realizing it's all a part of the contract. But you sometimes just got to go head first through the shit. And then on the other side of it, you'll see and get exactly the thing that you asked for. Do you relate to exactly. that in any ways? Uh, absolutely. And if we go back to the oldest civilizations, you know, um, they they worshipped and gave sacrifices to or something that was of value to receive something. They didn't expect to receive first and then give. They, you have to give first to receive, right? And that's mm-hmm. what uh, you said about you throwing something out there and then the reciprocates, you know. And that's that's how it is, you know. You you uh, with every ritual, the the intent should be the focus. Otherwise, if if you to out there, then it's just going to make it probably worse, more chaotic. So you have to have intent and uh, that will pay off sooner or later. But as I said, you have, it's not enough to uh, rest on your laurels after being uh, in the right place at the right time. Once you, you have to con- be that they are continuously, you know, that's, that's yeah. how it is. It's the idea that you can, fa- you can, uh, you can fall in and out of enlightenment that once you reach it once, you're not there forever. You have to keep on top of it. You have to keep working at it. And it's it's not getting easier. It's just getting harder and harder and harder. That's what people sure. don't don't get, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, and yeah. It's an ongoing process. It's not like, oh, now I'm there. You know, no. That's how it yeah. goes. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the reasons why I've come to very much appreciate the uh, just. Well, obviously, for like the last five or six years, you know, I have been training rigorously, you know, every single week, you know, four or five times a week, I have to do it. And one of the things for it is that, uh, you know, like, it's taught me a lot about just the philosophy of life doing that. Because, uh, you know, it's when you realize that life is about putting in the reps. It, it's, it's all about the, uh, the repetition of something, you know, that, that it's about putting in the work. Like you can have the best w- visions, you can have the best ideas, but unless you put in the work, those ideas don't mean jack shit. And I think that that's exactly where uh, it's one of the biggest lessons I think I actually took away from it, you know. But I think it's the, probably one thing that I can definitely uh, admire about what you guys are. There are many things, by the way, that I admire about uh, what uh, yourself and your band have done as artists, first and foremost. Like I said, there's the industry aspect of things. And yeah, the band is popular. But let's bring it back to the core, which is the fact that you're artists. When I look at just as an example, the I, the whole symphony thing that you guys did, you know, like the idea of a symphony is is um, is a philosophically challenging thing to me in a very positive way. In that, when you're writing a song, you can write just a series of single notes on one instrument, and that can be a song of its own. But what a symphony is is eighty of those different layers, <laughs> and all of it put together, all different sounds, all serving a specific purpose you know and to go through the logistics of that and to go through the pain of it the hassle the arrangements the oh making sure everyone is together i can only imagine how difficult that must have been to do but also how rewarding it must have truly been to stand on stage alongside that and perform that to your own audience knowing that you're basically sticking your flag into the ground at that moment uh in in time and space it's quite a powerful thing isn't it it is it is it's, as you say it's it's really rewarding and when you uh to me it's like i love making songs and creating and and performing it in the studio but to be able to play it live and perform it in front of people that's like the cream of the cake you know and mm. to be able to share that energy and your work that you have put in and you share that with the audience. I mean, it sounds cliche, but it is. It's true, you know. It's uh, and you know, some days uh, on 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 stage, you yeah, you might not have your best day, but it's still that interaction that that keeps the motivation going, you know. And to be able to share it with uh, share your work with with people that really are into what you do, and and you kind of have that two way energy uh, exchange, you know. I call it universal exchange for lack of a better word, but yeah. So that's um, um, that's amazing, and to also be able to do two festival, uh, two shows, one festival show and one proper indoor uh, show with orchestra. That that was like uh, amazing because you, the way I see it, is like Dimmus music has kind of like a perfection side to it, which is like yeah, you're on 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 album. And studio, that's like the perfect side of the band. But then live is the more straight to the meat and potatoes type mm. of um, punkish thing, you know, like you're out there without the parachute and what can go wrong could go wrong. You know, you never know. It's like so to be able to do that orchestra show in Oslo in 2011 uh, and everything went perfectly you know uh i think the only thing that was fucking up was one black screen somewhere uh, in the in the trailer you know so right. but apart from that it went really really great um and then one year later you you're going to perform the same thing with a different orchestra in uh, at Vakken in front of 80 70 80, 000 people or whatever and you have 45 minutes changeover to mic up 100 people on stage you know uh it's Jesus. like that's when you think that uh, we're just mad, you know, what, what can you do? This is like tipping, <laughs> tipping into madness, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but it's all about preparation, you know? And I think that's what um, we have learned. We had that before we played with orchestra, but we thought that once we got together with the cork uh, before the um, recordings of, uh, of the Abra Dabra um, album, 
Mm-hmm. We thought yeah. that we were professional, you know, like, you know, cocky and stuff. And then we see how focused they are and how they do stuff, you know, not to mention that they play off the notes without even hearing the song first, you know, that's one thing, but it's, it's just on a whole different level. And we were just like, our jaws dropped, you know, it's like, it's, ah, so this is how they do it. Okay. Well, we should rethink our professionality here, you know? So, <laughs> uh, we, we yeah. took some notes and, um, and we applied that to our way of, of doing things. And, um, and that's something that I, maybe I wish we could have done earlier, but anyway, anything at each given time. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah, but that, that was two really special shows and it was cool to, to be able to have it filmed and released, obviously. Uh, and, um, and looking back, it's, uh, it's two really huge thing in, in our careers. One of the biggest things. Yeah. It's it's beautiful, man. I, I revisited the walk-in one uh, quite recently in anticipation of our talks. And, you know, like when you just said about the 45-minute changeover there, as someone who has horrendous changeover anxiety, I just felt like my the palms of my hand started sweating as soon as you said that. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and we're only a four-piece band, you know, so that uh, I, I can't imagine the the whole thing. But what's amazing about it is how fucking good it sounds as well like the whole thing you know like what what you guys did with the doing um symphonic rendition of Dimi Borgir before actually playing the song i just thought that was flawless just such fucking great work it could be uh very tempting to uh to take the tracks that's recorded and uh, and uh and fine-tune them in the studio and uh, and add stuff on and blah 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 but it's all that's how we played it you know so uh, yeah. obviously mixed uh, in a in a proper fashion but uh because the 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 live broadcast uh sound from both shows were obviously like a quick broadcast sound you know so um and that's also why we when we wanted to release it we had to mix it properly and that took us some time as well but um it's all worth it you know and uh even if the release came out um quite late <laughs> it's still yeah. uh, something that's uh, of value it's really worth something it's it's part of our history and uh and it should be celebrated i i agree i i want to ask you a, a tough question about that though because obviously that was that felt like when that happened obviously you were celebrating the ban there was a lot leading up to it there was probably god knows how many years of daydreaming you guys must have had about that whole thing bef- before before it actually happened so did you kind of find that when you actually did it, did you have a moment of, well, now what kind of thing? I guess you can say that. Uh, but I think I think that dawned on us a little bit later than actually when it happened. So um, because we we have always had this approach, or not always, but at least on from, I would say, puritanical and onwards, we had more of a symphonic approach, for the lack of a better word. And... And to be able to um, to utilize the real deal, so to speak, uh, when it comes to strings and choirs and stuff, that's uh, that's very special, you know, and something that we felt that oh, that's totally doable in our in our sense because the transformation from keyboards and, and choirs that we do with um, our own technical. Uh, stuff and sounds whatever um to have it played by real people is uh it's not that far-fetched you know not at all so uh no offense to other bands that have played with orchestra from the metal and hard rock genre but their music probably most of the time are not made from that angle with that approach our music is so that's why it's it's easier to to combine, I think, and to also be work with uh, to be working with uh, Gato Sturos, who has helped us out in the past to transcribe notes because we don't really read notes. Uh, mm-hmm. Gary Lowe's probably read notes because he's uh, he's our keyboard player, but yeah, yeah, but the rest of us, we we know some tablature and uh, we know that stuff, you know. So um, we obviously need some professional uh, people to to help us out with that, and Gareth. Uh, he has been really good in what he's doing. He he really knows his shit, and uh, he 
could have turned out totally different if we had worked with a different um, director. You know, that's uh, that's a given. So we'll see for the next album if we're gonna go back to him and ask him for a few, uh, you know, services. We'll see. Right on. <laughs> Well, that's first of all, that's exciting to hear that there's the confirmation of the next album. Obviously, no pressure. You guys take your time, you know, release it whenever you, you want to release it. But, um, you know, it's, it's good news to hear that. And yeah, I think there's, uh, I have to say as well, like how impressive it is to be able to, like I said, with an orchestra and a symphony, there's so many layers to it that, you know, to be someone who, re who understands music via tablatures yet can still compose an orchestra, I think is a very impressive thing of its own, you know, so that's, you know, again, hats off. Um, I, I do want to tell you like a bit of an anecdote, you know, a slightly different subject, but actually you guys were the first band that I ever watched live. And, oh, really? uh, that's right. Yes. So obviously I'm originally born and raised in Iran, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, right. I, I discovered you whilst I was there just around, I think, I think I was 14 years old, maybe at the time. Uh, I discovered you through my guitar teacher and uh, he gave me, uh, you know, he gave me like some bootleg MP3 covers of... Uh, of some of your albums and whatnot, you know, and I had the uh, I had the bootleg DVD of your uh, of your first um, your very very first DVD actually from yeah, World, um, World Misanthropy. World Misanthropy. One, yeah. That's yeah. right, yeah. And me and my friend used to watch that religiously because you guys were like unlike anything that surrounded us in that country and in that environment. And it was like, you know, like, I mean, over there, like drinking's not even allowed. You can, you can go to prison for drinking. You can, you can get, go to prison for listening to rock music, let alone black metal. And obviously to us, we were like totally fucking engulfed in that re spirit of rebellion, which still carries on today, obviously. Yeah, of course. It's, um, it's, it's something that's uh, inherent with us, you know, and, yeah. and that's, that's cool that you mentioned that because, uh, uh, obviously, I had a total different upbringing, but I also felt that uh, disgust with author authoritarian uh, mm. thing, you know, and that's yeah, oppression, yeah, yeah, oppression, basically, yeah. So, uh, but there's different levels of it, and uh, I, I cannot even imagine how it was uh, for you guys. But uh, uh, we had it pretty easy here in comparison, I bet. But at the same time, the, the foundation is is very similar that you. Uh, I think so. That you want yeah. to rebel to something that someone is telling you, oh, you cannot do this. You can only do this. And that's like, to this day, if people tell me that, I'm going to do the exact opposite. But, you know, that's just how I am. <laughs> Brother, I, I relate to that so fucking much. You know, it's like every every cell in my body operates in that way. It's really good. And, and I think that's that's what's great about it, you know. And, and again, being rebellious isn't uh, just about, I don't know, drinking alcohol and then causing mayhem, you know, because that's the thing that to us at the time seemed so fucking bizarre because we'd never seen anything like that. But at the same time, I think it's the at the core of it is is the spirit of living life on your own terms, which is the mm. most beautiful thing of all, you know. And I almost feel like a life not lived in that way is just wasted, almost, you know. And yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. And uh, if it's if it means you have to fight for it, so be it, you know. Maybe that's even a better thing to be fighting for it and not being handed to you, you know. Because uh, that's Sacrifice. that way. It's, yeah, exactly. We're back to the sacrifice thing, and that uh, mm -hmm. also the battery song. But yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right on. You know, the, the the thing I will say though, man, is uh, you know, I, I guess this might be somewhat of a controversial area. I don't think it should be. By the way, I think this is something everyone should be discussing. But I'll ask you this because I know that you're someone who, let's say, from age. 14 i believe you said you you uh you sort of rejected uh, religion and uh, i remember six. age six six okay yes. well, i'm eight years off that's that's even uh, that's even better um yeah because i remember you saying that in, in the in the interview uh, i think on that particular dvd saying that oh yeah you rejected religion at that time you know and that was something that to me being surrounded well, by more, islam was probably more focused the rejection but uh, i remember when i was six uh, about six years old because um, i grew up in what we call around here the bible belt and right. to be interacting with um with other kids my age, apart from uh, playing football and skis and stuff like that, you, there was like some some uh, something called Sunday school, 
but it wasn't a Saturday, so it was called Saturday School, and right. it was basically religious. But I, I wasn't brought up uh, religious, but that was the only way for me to interact with other kids my age. So, uh, but obviously it was religious. So um, uh, if I hadn't been there maybe two Saturdays in a row, I didn't get as many stars in my welcome card, you know? So I wasn't as good as the other kids because I hadn't paid attention. I, I was away for more than the others. And that's how I realized, okay, so I'm not as good as the others in the eyes of this religion, you know? Mm. That's how I figured out, you know what? Fuck that. I didn't say that, but subliminally or subconsciously, I, I knew there was something weird about this being treated differently because you you wear differently already, you know? So that's how I kind of figured it out pretty early on that this authoritarian, uh, especially from a religious point of view, is like fucking bullshit, man. So <laughs> mm, <laughs> that's, yeah. and then later on, I, I used that feeling when I had back then, I used that to, to utilize the, the somewhat the lyrical concept of in sort of the Diaboli, you know? Yes. And, uh, and it just, the verse just poured out of me because that's just, it was easy to write about, you know, it was something that yeah. was self-explored and uh, I could take it any direction I wanted. And uh, the other guys was cool with it, you know, it's like, you know, because everybody has somewhat of a similar upbringing, you know, uh, especially with um, being told what to do and what not to do. So yeah. you could bring everybody's feelings into that concept and uh, yeah. I think, you know, I, that that's, by the way, an extremely valuable thing, you know, and, um, you know, and, and these are th things that might seem pretty to talk about, you know, saying, oh, yeah, living life on your own terms. But that's, it's another thing to actually live it and, and you know, and, and, and do the work in, in that, in that uh, realm. And uh, obviously, again, something I totally relate to. But what I will say is, you know, like religion on its own if you just want to look at it as a thing of like, you know, it's it's an individual thing. I've grown to see that maybe it has benefits for some people. What I don't like about it is the fact that it's shoved down other people's throats. Exactly. And, you know, and, and you know, I will also say this, that the, the freedom that I've gained from rejecting that, and, uh, and I'm sure you have as well, is something that... I carried with me into the current era of the world and, and the modern times. So for you, as a, someone who is such an advocate of freedom and living life on your own terms, and this is certainly something that's prevalent in pretty much all of your lyrics, I would say, is one thing that's, you know, is that sense of empowerment and taking control, you know, whether it's the lyrics to, I don't know, Gateways or like a lot of the in sort of Diaboli stuff, which is very powerful, yep. great. How do you respond to the way things have been in the last few years where that herd mentality has sort of taken over things in um in, in in to an extent that perhaps it never had done before so we find ourselves in the situation where that authoritarianism that you speak about is the most it's ever been prevalent not just in middle eastern countries but all over the world especially western countries how do you find that you personally sort of deal with that well, I think it's, for me personally, it's become clearer and clearer, actually, that uh, it's almost like every man for himself <laughs> hmm. at some point. Um, but it's uh, uh, after so many years uh, of, um, of reading about uh, different religion and different uh, um, yeah, past, the old religions before they got handed down and stolen and, and mixed up and mixed mashed and all that stuff so now it's the last few Spit years from you... different tongues if i recall you saying yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh now it's it's different and i think it's it's easy to see that um uh, when i was young i started questioning early on and um 
even back to when I was six at that so-called Sunday school, when I when I started asking questions and they didn't have any answers for it or they didn't want to answer it, that's another clue that like, okay, something fishy about this. So this doesn't really mm-hmm. resonate with me anymore. Or it never did. But in the in the later years, it's easier to see what um what the good parts of various religions can help you uh, realize yourself, obviously, because there's there's parts in everything that you can use for your own benefit, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's easy to see it now when you have it so far away or from you, you know. And then you can pick out like, oh, this makes sense. This makes sense. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> so I'm going to avoid this, but this makes sense. So I'm going to pull this out. Yeah. And uh, and then you, that's how you create you create your own universe basically and uh, and uh, attention goes where you focus I guess. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. If, if you if you focus negatively, uh, no matter how positive that religion sounds, you're not gonna get over that hurdle because your 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 mind is still in the negative default setting. So it's whatever you have to do and and. To make yourself uh, a betterment of yourself, basically, that's that's mm-hmm. important. So, um, yeah, th- there's a lot of stuff that we can pull from from different various uh, teachings and whatnot, you know. But it's uh, you come to the conclusion that you you can only take care of yourself, and if you can't take care of, take care of yourself, how the hell are you going to be able to take care of anybody next to you? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a that's a given. That's like one of the biggest principles within life. I think the thing that I am perhaps uh, quite intrigued by is the fact that that mentality, that religious mentality, is obviously very clearly not exclusive to just religion anymore. But even no. if I want to make the example of you know, like let's say in the last few years, like there's still people now who are like. They have to wear their masks because the boogeyman virus is going to come and get them or, you know, and obviously it's not to say that the, the virus is not real. I've, I've had it and what, you know, and it, and it sucks. But the response to it is um, I've personally felt was extremely exaggerated, you know, and I feel like I see the same patterns of thought that oh, you have to wear the mask, you have to stay at home, you have to be depressed, you have to be sad, and you know, and if you don't get the vaccine, you don't do this, you don't do that, then you're an infidel, then you're an outsider, you should be shunned. To me, that's exactly what I experienced growing up in a Muslim country. To me, it's exactly the same school of thought, you know, and it's that, mm. and, and all it really comes down to is control, is controlling the masses, controlling the population, saying that, yes, you should stay at home, don't do anything, don't go out and get fresh air. Don't exercise. You know, stay at home, look at the TV, watch exactly what we are telling you, which is, again, same thing as like, I don't know, saying, yeah, you only follow the Bible. Only the Bible is real. Right. Now it's only the mainstream media is real. And if you dare question it, then you're an outsider. <laughs> yeah. You're an exactly. infidel. You deserve if to you, die because dare, of it. Uh, if you dare question why healthy food is more expensive than non-healthy food, then it's like, what? Yeah, you're yeah. all of a sudden a right-wing conspiracy theorist exactly. by saying that, why aren't we eating healthy? <laughs> it's crazy. It's insane. Yeah, it's, it's almost like everything has been, uh, well, to me, everything has been upside down and backwards for so long now. But I think the last few years, uh, the so-called normies out there uh, are really having a really dissonance uh, cognitive dissonance uh experience why i mean really bad one because this is yeah. what they're being told doesn't resonate with them and yeah. what they see doesn't add up you know and and you know if 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 you're a bit slow in starting to ask questions you could tell that you know people are s- slowly kind of waking up to to the bullshit you know they're just smelling the fucking uh, yeah, there's something <laughs> weird going on, you know. Yeah, but 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 by which point it may be too late for them, you know, because the the let's say the wealth shift already happened and the control. Yeah, and that's been under underway for so many decades, maybe uh, centuries, you know. Uh, yeah. We we coming to coming to the boil now, you know, and uh, and as I say, it might be too late for some, but. Uh, but I think you, you, this is also maybe a religious type of thing that um, you, at 
at the end of the day, you have to answer to yourself uh, mm. at your uh, last days. So you have to answer to yourself. And uh, if you get to not be killed off quickly and you, you end up at, um, at the nursery home or your, um, on your deathbed, then if you, if you make peace with yourself, then that's a good start for the next one, you know, uh, instead of, you know, holding grudge because towards yourself and others like, oh, maybe I should have done this instead more of all this um, regret bullshit. That's that's also something I learned pretty early on to to try and work my way out of because it's, you know, I see everything as a learning instead of regrets, you know, it's regret is such negatively loaded word. And uh, and when I'm being mm -hmm. asked, like, oh, what could you have done differently? And I'm always saying that if I would have done differently, then that means I wouldn't be talking to you right now, basically. Sure. So, And I'm glad that uh, you are, by the way. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, it's it's about you. you you got to make peace with yourself. And the sooner, the better. I'm not saying people should wait until their deathbed. <laughs> Hopefully, they do it a bit sooner than that. But, you know. Sure. Uh, and that's that starts with uh, asking questions, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. the sooner you can start asking questions and and also be uh, be fine with not having the answer to everything that's another that's good really important like thing you know because yeah, yeah. It's, to start uh, asking questions and then expect there's, there's a finite answer to it it's, that's not always going to be the case far from it absolutely it's the idea that if someone claims to have all the answers they're either lying or they're trying to sell you something exactly you know? exactly and uh uh, was it McKenna that said you should follow plants, not gurus? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I, I love McKenna, by the way. That that, that yeah. guy's. Uh, we, we can we can talk about him, but uh, this uh, this this whole conversation also brings me to this really interesting quote, if I recall correctly, by uh, I believe it was Mark Twain, but it was that uh, a, a person who gives away their liberty in exchange for safety deserves neither, neither. liberty nor yeah. safety. Exactly. And I think that's exactly the, that's exactly the thought process, you know, and as soon as you find yourself in life in a situation where you're not allowed to ask questions, where you're not allowed to say certain things, where you're not allowed to express yourself in a supposedly Western free world of democracy, then you know <coughs> something is wrong. The simple fact that you can't ask those questions is a problem, you know, now, that doesn't mean that, you know, maybe the answer to it turns out to be that, Oh yeah, well, actually, I guess that uh, you know that 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 question was not you know the the answer wasn't what you thought it was going to be. But was it worth asking the question at least? Absolutely. But then when you find yourself in a situation where the experts, quote unquote, are uh, you know are, are who are actually by the way funded by the same people who caused the problem that are now trying to sell a solution to it, are are trying to mute any of these questioning, then you should be like, well, hang on a minute, you're trying to hide something. Like, are you making money out of doing this? What are you gaining from this? Why are you trying to silence this? And then the more they repeat the narrative, some people mm -hmm. fall for it. Some others who are perhaps, um, you know, I mean, honestly, I feel I feel privileged. I genuinely feel privileged to have grown up in the country that I did, to have seen things in the way that I did, to have then also been inspired by metal and black metal, you know, and, and also bands like yourselves, you know, that put that at least seed of free thinking into people's heads. I'm very grateful to have gone through that, even though it wasn't pleasant, because I recognize totalitarianism i recognize authoritarianism so when it's back at my own doorstep uh, you know like to me three years ago i was like ha huh, deja yeah. vu i've already yeah, been exactly. here before yeah. you right. know so that's that's i think a really important thing but I'll, i'm gonna ask you a very very open-ended question and then we can go wherever we want from here but what is the idea of uh, freedom to you so let's say you've spent all these years doing the thing that that you've done i think at the core of it perhaps is freedom okay so doing things your way writing the music and then touring all over the world and releasing all the albums spending all those hours into the studios making all those sacrifices to me that is i view that from my perspective as a quest for freedom so to you as a person, as a man, as a human being, 
how do you define freedom? Pretty much the same way. Um, and also, um, I look upon myself as I'm the one in power of my surroundings, my own environment. So uh, if I let myself get offended, which is re very, very rare, and uh, that's something I really, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> that's uh, because to me, it's um, we all have that choice to to choose freedom, whatever comes with freedom comes uh, to me a bigger responsibility you know it's not with freedom i don't mean that you you can drop everything and uh well obviously do as you please but there's, for every action there's a reaction there's a consequence so if you choose to do something in the name of freedom then there, there could be a consequence for that and if you're ready to take that then so be it you know that that's yes. probably more ultimate freedom you know and uh, but if if you're a smart person you you play by the rules of, of your heart, you know, and it, you know that, okay, for me, it's wrong to kill uh, another life, to take another life. That's To me, that's wrong. To somebody else, it might not be wrong. But if you choose to do so, then there are consequences most likely for that, you know. Therefore, uh, we're all different. And we we that's why I mean with responsibility, it comes down to that. You you're totally responsible uh, responsible for yourself and your actions and um so that's that's the ultimate freedom for me i think absolutely absolutely and and i think that it, it, i guess it's it's as i said earlier is that there are only trade-offs no solutions yeah yeah you started with that early and that that comes back now so it's yeah you're on to something <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that, i mean that that initial observation for me it came actually from uh looking at uh, political policies you know and it's like understanding how policies work you know with depend like you know regardless of which party they're presented by the idea of it is always that it's not always a direct solution you know whether you want to talk about i don't know borders or if you want to talk about taxes or, or whatever uh, there's always um it's never um a solution but but rather a trade-off or something else so once you commit to that something else somewhere else is going to go wrong you know and then this is this yeah. is the nature of our reality the matrix that we live in you know it always um functions off of that you know that there's always yeah. um a trade within everything there's a there's a universal exchange again mm -hmm. and uh and i think that's that's what gives value to things as well because otherwise you know like i i kind of hate it when when people have this like entitled way of thinking of like oh well food should just be free or you know or, or like you know th these kind of things you know that like oh every person deserves to deserves to be you know like this and that and listen i get it in a perfect world that would be the case but also why like mm. exactly you know you know you observe nature and you have to understand that the world that we live in is we are nature only... doesn't give a fuck about your feelings <laughs> exactly <laughs> and that's why so. it's great it's, it's a humbling force you know that you I, I find that the more i observe nature the better i understand life you know and that we're always comfortable saying like oh why should I work? Why should I do this and that? Why should I have to do this? And then it's like, well, it's a trade-off for something else. If you don't like it, you're more than welcome to step outside and then see and then find things for yourself. And that's the yeah. thing that that I, I, mean, I, I truly it's believe up in that. Up, up to each and everyone. But if if you want to be lazy, there's also consequences for that, like huge yeah. consequences for that, both yeah. mentally, physically, and spiritually. You know, uh, and why shouldn't you want to work hard? Work hard to me is. Uh, working on the music but that's that's not to say i don't i cannot pick up a spade and work in the garden or or drive the tractor on the on the field you know that's not a problem that's not work to me work is to do something that you basically just have to do to be able to survive or to get the, the money right so yeah. and um but in the past, people have uh, survived fine without even money, if you look at it that way. And then what would what imagine, imagine what they had to do to <clears throat> to do to stay alive back then, you know, and just as a comparison. Yeah, it's different Absolutely. times now. Yeah, sure, I get it. But the, the bottom line is pretty much the same. It's like you, you do what you have to do to 
to make your life the best as you can make for yourself. And that's initially going to help the people next to you. It's like when you sit on the, take take the plane somewhere and you get asked to like put the, the mask on top of yourself before helping the one next to you. That's, it's that simple. It's, mm. you know, it sounds egotistical, but it's the exactly the opposite, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at the core of it is also just what time is because that is our most valuable currency. And the uh, the money that you get is not in exchange for your services, but it's for your time. And right. uh, and uh, this, this is one thing, actually, I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, there's this uh, doctor uh, called uh, Peter Atia, and he does this, uh, he put out this thing, I, I thought it was really fascinating, I'm actually interested in getting it myself, but it was basically a calendar for your whole life. And basically mm. what it is, is that it sort of like breaks down, well, how many years do you roughly expect you're going to be around? Okay, so let's put all of that together and then it's like this giant calendar you can put on the wall and then it actually separates all the days. So here is how many weeks you've got left before you die and what are you going to do? And I fucking love that. I think that's yeah. incredible, you know, because so many times that's an idea that scares us so much. We try and run away from it, but the more you run away from it, it's almost like the deeper the hole gets. It's almost like it catches up with you faster the more you run away from it, you know? And then it's this um, this really interesting thing, you know, like that 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 whole, the, the idea of the, the fear of death and what that does and its correlation with time. But where I'm going with this is that I wanted to ask you, obviously, when you, obviously, let's say 30 years of Dimabor gear, when you reflect back on the many years have, that have gone by, when you, when you reflect back on Sven from whether it's the camo pants era or if it's the, uh, the spikes and weapons era or whatever, you know, and the corpse bin, what's some of like the, the biggest lessons that, that you feel like you have carried through with you? as you sit here with us now? I think in general, it must be that uh, when you are um, too blind to see that you're in the comfort zone, because uh, to me, I learned that comfort zones could be like uh, looked at as some type of um, early death to your dreams, basically. Mm. Be right. Because uh, that's like, you know, you're just like floating through, you know, and there's no ups and downs. So it's like very one dimensional, two, three dimensional, nothing is happening, you know, and you just go by old habits and whatnot. But something somewhere kicks in that makes a ripple and that, you know, that makes sure that you're out of your comfort zone. And that's when you have the most learning and when you're outside yeah. your comfort zone. So if you want to, progress with whatever it is um you need to get out of that comfort zone but sometimes it could be tricky to recognize when you're in the comfort zone so i think um another thing also of course with with the band is to do the same thing over and over again which we try not to do but at the same time there's a uh, there's a red thread through our uh expression right so that's that's something that will be with us until we stop um uh, and um yeah so it's it's about pushing yourself and uh and maybe that's also why it takes longer between each album because yeah of course you have other things on the side but you you just want to push yourself and make sure you don't repeat yourself too much i mean we like you said in, uh, initially we all steal riffs from the same pot right <laughs> 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 but we, sure. we kind of try and make a new uh, variation of it and uh and uh yeah everything so is just black sabbath yeah, yeah pretty much yeah <laughs> it. so it's, yeah it's it's about not being caught in your uh, own bullshit basically because mm -hmm. that's to me the comfort zone is your own bullshit Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, man, you know, and it's that, you know, you don't grow by, by being complacent, you know, I mean, once upon a time, if I may share from like a personal thing, there was a time where I was close to 120 kilos, you know, and, uh, and my life was a fucking mess. And I was always just like, this is some years ago, but I was just like, so depressed, 
always anxious, always like, oh no, whoa me, wow, boo hoo me, yeah. oh no, you know, like everything is so position. terrible. <laughs> the victim mentality, exactly. Yeah. That's a fucking cancer you can never let into your mind. That is regardless. cancer. That is literally cancer because yeah. that's gonna uh, fuck up your cells first of all, and those yeah. are gonna fucking grow to probably cancer, and yeah. then so the the victim mentality is cancer literally absolutely absolutely and and you don't realize what it's doing to you you know like I, I, all it takes is for you to just flick a switch and just look at life from a different perspective you know it's all a matter of perspective you know it, and then to realize that life's not happening to you but it's happening for you and the moment you realize that that you realize that oh i actually have the control to fix this yeah exactly you sit back in your chair and like um um, yeah what if i go and get a glass of water now who does that i am right? yeah it's, <laughs> it's a it's good analogy simple. yeah 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 it's absolutely yeah and i think it's that you know you you realize that that you have to create opportunities for yourself like think of it like this think of what's within your dna that you know your ancestors had to fight so fucking hard just to live and survive through one day when they were tormented by nature well but whether it was by the cold or whether it was by the lack of food and resources and their dna has been passed on all the way to where you are now and you want to sit around and complain that oh my life sucks because not enough people like the picture you posted on facebook really right right ex 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 exactly yeah. it's like if uh, if my grandmother wouldn't uh smuggle ammunition for the resistance uh through checkpoints then right you know then what <laughs> <laughs> so it's there's a lot Absolutely. of um things that needs to be in place at the right time at, at the right place all the fucking time for us to be here yeah exactly you know it's like same as yourself like let's say you're on tour there might be days where you're not feeling great you might be tired or like you know like and then obviously torn has this wear and tears on the body and 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 a whole lot of it you know just standing up playing guitar for a long period of time it's just not really great for your posture uh, as i've come to discover in the later years and uh, <laughs> <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and uh, you know and and that's you know doing it all the time you know you have to have perspective of what you've been through just to have that position just to even be able to to have people waiting out there at the front barrier waiting for you to come out and perform something that you created in your own solitude you know and you might yeah. be tired you might be missing loved ones at home and might be all of those things but you know the, the show must go on and that is a principle that i think applies to all of life the entirety yeah. of it the full the whole full scope of things what you're saying is that you, you have to be present at all times which is the same yeah. pretty much as i said like you have to be at the right place at the right time all the time absolutely so, man. so absolutely. that's uh you, you cannot uh, get away from yourself so you have a deal you you make that deal with yourself and trying to make the best for yourself instead of the worst for yourself but sometimes it's can be clouded to to see through that fog you know uh but i, I think it comes with um with experience and what better way to get experience than to get out there in, instead of your couch and in your comfort zone so, absolutely hell yeah. yeah you know can i just ask you a question as well this is just out of curiosity particularly because you mentioned mckenna earlier have you mm. uh, got any experience of psychedelics at all yeah, absolutely. Sure. I mean, I, I didn't want to make the presumption there, you know. <laughs> no, 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 but I, I did it myself. <laughs> I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, sure. sure. Um, but you you learned uh, the hard way when you were young, right? So, uh, <laughs> right, okay. And to not mix that with uh, other substances at the same time, obviously. So, uh, oh boy. That's, that's how you, you know, get, uh, you get a good smack on the face and, uh, mm -hmm. But that's a great learning as well. You know? I think so, yeah. Especially yeah. for what it does to the ego. It is so invaluable, I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. In invaluable darkness, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we sit here all day, I'm going to be just the quoting your own stuff back at you, man. Well, I, <laughs> I can, you can remind me of stuff that I've maybe I've forgotten as well. So, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I think that that's what's great about psychedelics. I don't think they're like a mandatory thing. 
um i i don't know like it's it's a, it's a weird one because i feel like when uh, you know because i've tried most things i am actually sober okay so i don't drink i don't smoke i don't, I don't do anything but then you know like earlier this year i still t- did uh, did some dmt you know and mm-hmm. uh, that's something I, I find to be very valuable and i'd still be open to other psychedelics let's say like psilocybin you know I, i'm very very fascinated with what that one does and how how it interacts with time in particular where like everything just kind of slows down and then your vision becomes very interesting um but i think at the core of it is just how those things interact with the ego you know like where you experience like ego death and then you begin to view the universe from this perspective of you are at one with everything all at once but then i also relate that feeling to the same feeling that you might get don't know if you might relate to this but like let's say you're just sat on the nightliner looking out into the night in the middle of the night after having just poured your heart out on stage and going through the tiredness of it and then you find yourself in this trance of you just feel at one with the world all the yeah. light and all the darkness like poured into one and i don't know yeah. I, don't, I don't know how much that's that you feel speaking a sense there. of uh, accomplishment um, because you have let's take for instance you go on stage you play a show there, there's something there's a certain danger uh, element to it in the sense that there's so much things that can fuck up, right? So not that you you have the chance of being killed, but that you could fuck up your own art, and that's not a cool thing, you know. Especially if it's out of your control, if it's someone else's uh, human fault or whatever. But um, I think the the sense of accomplishment and to be able to recognize that you've gone through a, a challenge, and you sit mm. back and relax. Ah, oh, I'm I. I overcame that challenge. That it's the same thing to me. It's the same thing in the, and also with the ego that thing. That's one thing. But I see it's ego is the negative ego is is not favorable for you. But your survival instinct is, and it's sometimes mm. um, hard to differentiate uh, which one is which. You know, sometimes. And sure. So it's 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 usually our own mind that plays the best tricks on us you know it's no one else it's it's our own mind i agree yeah and sometimes you can just the 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 negative ego as you put it is the one that creates problems for no reason when there aren't any by imagining the worst things by imagining the worst intentions in other people when there aren't any exactly yeah. And then we're starting to think projection again, you know, and then there's a whole yeah. other different uh, alley we can uh, explore. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, listen, man, I, I I feel you on that. But I think there there's an interesting thing. If Even if you just wanted to like sort of dissect the idea of what even the consciousness is within a human being, you know, how sometimes you just know things without knowing them or how you interact with people how sometimes certain things happen you know where um you know like even things like the mandela effect i don't know if you're familiar with that at all yeah it's very fascinating you know like what what we even are as as human beings you know where it's like uh, we could all somehow be like connected through through things you know like at the moment we're connected through the internet and social media and 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 radio or, or, or whatever but i feel like there's there's something else there that if you got rid of all of that, if you if we could all somehow connect in this other way that you can't quite measure with these things. It's almost like we 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 know, but we cannot remember for the fuck of it. You know, it's like it's right. tip of our tongue all the yeah. fucking time. It's like almost there. You know, so yeah. But that yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's fascinating, and and that also brings me back to what I said earlier about. Um, uh, we have to to be in peace we have to be okay with not knowing all the answers you know and and just um, who said this again I can't remember but anyway there's a difference between faith and trust Mm -hmm. and that makes a whole lot of sense because if you trust something that to me that has nothing to do with faith faith is like you're going in blind right but yeah. trust is, is when you you inherently know something, but you cannot maybe put the you know the point it out properly or put the right word to it. So that could be it's a huge difference for me. So uh, 
Um, I put I it down like to the gut and... feeling. Yeah. 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 And, and, and how literal that can be as well. You know, I mean, you think of, you know, the fact that we're made of, each one of us is made of billions of different, uh, of, of microbes, you know, and, and all these microbiomes and things that are, that are within yeah. us, you know, and how like even 90% of your serotonin is created within the gut. It's how when you say something, you get a feeling in your stomach afterwards you know and it tells you did you say the right thing or the wrong thing are you stupid mm. for saying what you just said or no or no you yeah, you, exactly. you, you did good there the right uh, connection right away either or, yeah. you know and uh, uh, yeah it's uh, it's it's peculiar you know it's very interesting it and the older we get the more we uh, feel connected to this whatever it is and maybe for me at least i don't know about you but for me it's like i've never really been a materialistic person anyway but you know i don't have the need to have uh fancy stuff you know or or even a lot of stuff actually i feel like i always have too much stuff so uh <laughs> that's probably why people should move every th three years or so to get rid of fucking clutter and bullshit because that that has an impact on you if you have if you live in the house and you have a lot of sh shit around you you know it's like my my barn out here is full of stuff you know just collecting stuff you know i don't know if you know the word um, the series hoarders okay yeah, yeah i'm familiar yeah. with it yeah, so yeah, yeah. We, we could probably do like three four episodes just in my barn you know <laughs> <laughs> granted sure. it's not only my own but uh actually there's not that much of my own stuff but uh keep collecting for others as well and it's just because it has great space you know but um it's like having a lot of bullshit around your physical uh objects and stuff that just takes your energy it does. Okay. If, if you if you're out in the woods and there's nothing around but trees and rocks and whatever, then you don't feel the same way. At least I don't. So it's mm. I can't speak for everybody, obviously, but uh, it's a whole different feeling. Now, can I tell you something? The reason why there's a big fuck off smile on my face for like the last two minutes whilst you've been talking about that, I am currently sat in. Well, this is my usual headquarters. Um, I am sat in an empty room right now. I've lived here for four years. And as soon as we finish this conversation, uh, the only reason why I'm here was just to do this podcast. And, uh, and I had a rehearsal with my band last night as well. As soon as I finish this conversation, I'm catching a train to go to the other city where, uh, where my partner is. And I'm officially out of here for good. Like as soon as we finish this conversation, I'm handing in the keys to the, oh, wow. uh, to the landlord. Yeah, that's that's my plan for today. Wow. And uh, and what you say, where you say that you got to move every few years and you got to get rid of stuff, man, is that fucking true? Because I've literally just experienced it for like the last few weeks. And, yeah. you know, there, there's this like memories attached to every object, you know, that you're like, that you want to keep it because you're like, oh no, but this is the memory from that time. So-and-so person got right, me this. Right. And, but then, you know, then again, maybe you haven't seen it for three years, so you haven't needed it for three years. So yeah. it's just a, it's just a pinch in your side that oh well maybe I should keep it because it's I could get you know, handy in in the future whatever you know it's yeah yeah, it's, yeah there, but that's I think that's the if I may say that's the problem because that's how I justify keeping a lot of shit that I just don't fucking need. And I think it's like that in life, you know, we, we almost hold on to, you know, it's not just the physical thing, but it's the mental thing as well. We hold on to so much shit that just doesn't serve us any purpose, you know, and it's just like the sooner you find resolute, you know, it's like sometimes you're trying to sleep at night and then an interaction that you had eight years ago with some random person comes <laughs> and starts fucking haunting you. It's like, oh, fuck, I should have yeah. said this instead. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> and, you, and you yourself making a point out of it. So you the reason why you can't sleep, not not the situation, not the person, nothing yeah. else, but yourself. <laughs> exactly it's, uh, it's funny how that works <laughs> yeah yeah but i think it's it's that's like to us i think life is movement so the more you try and like hold on to something you know but but you know like just as tight as possible it's like please stay here please stay here i think that's mm. a degree of comfort and the sooner you let go of that the sooner you can move on and grow and see what else is on the way as well yeah it's like that uh, quote uh 
and don't worry, nothing is under control. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yes. If, you, if you try to control stuff, that is, everything else is going to be more and more uncontrolled, more and more chaotic. Mm. If if you if you focus on oh, I need to be on top of things, I need to control things. It's like then the opposite is going to happen. Ex yeah, right? hundred percent, hundred percent. One of the best things that I find happened to me. I don't know if you've had periods in your life where you had this maybe after the symphony thing but for me for pretty much the entirety of not just my teenagehood but my adult life up until that point three years ago I identified myself as Cheyenne from Trivex the band Trivex you know it's like yes I'm the front man I'm the composer this and that that was my entire identity in a relationship that was my identity at a workplace that was my identity you know always so trying to protect it so hard you know it's like this is what I am this is what I am against the world and then mm -hmm. when the time of the pandemic came or scamdemic whatever when that happened I turned around and said you know like okay I might not play a show ever again is this still going to remain my identity? And then I went through a, like a year or so. It was quite difficult, but eventually I had to find myself outside of that. And that was one of yeah. the best things that ever happened to me, you know. And arguably, I would say that our the best of our work came after that change, whether it was with the live shows or like the videos or any of the work that we did. It came yeah. after that because it's like, you know, I don't I know that I can do that as a part of my life and I'll do it when it feels good and when it feels right. But I don't have yeah. to walk around every single minute of every day being a frontman from a black metal band. Does that make sense? No, and then you 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 put distance to it saying that I'm in control, not this thing is in control. Because if yes. you if you would let it to be in control, maybe that would not happen then because you would be so focused on controlling it that you know it will just implode. You know, but if if you sit back and let okay, all right, I'm gonna just leave it there now for a minute and not focus on it, and then you know, absolutely. So and and I, you're you're right on the money with that, and this is the reason why I bring this up is how do you feel to that? Because you know, like so much of your life has been being Silenos and not Sven, perhaps, and I think. Uh, you know that that's that's the those are the memory that that memories that get left behind. You know, is that you you have to be that person or or character. So, um, did you have any point where you almost intentionally had to kind of step away from it? You know, and perhaps you know. Um, I think just... it was the other way around. Actually, when I was younger, uh, I took the character Silenos from the the Greek mythology, right? To the, the right, guy yeah. with the bald head, crooked nose, beer gut, and you know, uh, he liked to be drunk all the time in the woods, but blah, 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 blah. And as time passed on, it's like I morphed more and more into this character, <laughs> but <laughs> the way it looks and uh, and it's depicted and uh, and how it acted. And then it's like, so it, to me, it's like going on stage or off stage or whatever it is. I'm just as much that character for myself, but that just just for the fun of it basically but mm. it is me it if i look on an old uh, paintings or depictions of silenos you know that's that's me <laughs> i'm yeah. fine with it and uh I, I don't feel like i have to be either or you know if, if uh, people want to look at me as that character that's fine if they want to look at me as sven that's perfectly fine and i'm not trying not to be too attached to to labels and uh and whatnot. So uh, actually, I, I try to avoid being to any label at all. So when people call us like, oh, you're just this and that, you're not black male, you're blah, blah. okay, <laughs> fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, when you're young, that's probably something uh, that uh, is more crushing for the ego, you know, uh, coming from that genre that we actually do come from or stem from. But when you get older, it's like you know, not, nothing of that label bullshit matters anymore. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. either either this music that we make is doing something for you or it doesn't. You know, it, it's yeah. pretty much that simple. Um, well, if I listen to your band or if I watch you live, I don't think that, oh, I'm watching a symphonic black metal band. No, I think I'm watching or listening to Dimmu Borgir. Simple as right, that's exactly, it. and that that's the best compliment an artist can get. You know, it's it's because it's no label attached to it, apart from the 
the name or the banner of the name. Sure. And that's yeah, what yeah. we represent when we when we go on on tour and when we record albums, release music. That's that's the banner we have chosen to represent, and uh, and uh, that's it's quite quite rewarding when people cannot uh, categorize us for whatever reason. That's like yeah, that's that's a great compliment, you know. Absolutely. You know, I, I whilst I have you on the podcast, I absolutely have to tell you about this story. Um, it's a it's a moment that your music created that uh, that is is quite interesting for me. And I've never shared this before, but um, <clears throat> so with a bit of backstory, this is still when I was in Iran. So uh, this was just before I turned 16. So my birthday is on 15th of November. And uh, this was like maybe just a couple of weeks before that, right? And uh, and then this was the very first time I actually got to rehearse with a band. Because when I was like trying to find musicians to play with in Iran, there was no one there, you know. Especially not someone who was like listening to, I don't know. And who, or... who, and who could you trust? And you can't right? trust anyone. Yeah, yeah. Right. You, you don't know if someone's gonna go fucking like rat on the police or or something Either like that. that. Or if someone is already under surveillance or or whatever, you know, it's like that must have been. Yeah, I can only imagine. You, you actually make a very valid point. I'm, I'm I'm glad that you understand the dynamics of things here. That that's very good. Um, it, it helps us establish the 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 story even better. So here's the thing. Um, I ended up finally like just around. Yeah, so ju just like a couple of weeks before my birthday, like early November, ended up um, going to uh, this rehearsal place, you know, where there was like, a, there was actually a drummer. And then the, these guys kind of had been building these like uh, this basement with like egg cases and whatnot. Anyway, long story short, there was this other uh, gentleman who was also the guitarist and he was kind of like auditioning the same day that I was. Um and, uh, you know, like we both, each one of us had exactly like the, like a 10 inch amp, you know, I had the Laney and then he had like a small, tiny, shitty Marshall. And then, you know, like we had him like next to each other. He had the Ibanez, uh, like one of those, you know, cheap RG uh, mm -hmm. types of Ibanez guitars. And then I had my Yamaha and I was sat there and I hadn't played a single note that entire rehearsal. Now, bear in mind, just the odds of such a thing even happening in Iran, you're going to like this. So I'm sat there on the other side of the room. I remember we weren't like me and the other guitarist weren't talking too much. Um, and then he sat on the other side and we've only just kind of got there. And I'd ha I had my amp plugged and whatnot. I'm not playing anything. And then he he's on the clean channel. And then he proceeds to play this melody. And it's the intro to Arcane Life Force Mysteria. Uh -huh. So... Just think of the odds here, right? You know, that's like a, a totally rare song of yours, first of all. First of then, all, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then he's playing that. This, this was a fucking killer moment. You know, it was, I wish it was recorded. So he starts playing that and I'm like, oh shit. All right. Okay. So then I kind of like really, really like slowly start like bringing the volume up on my guitar, you know, without him, you know, like uh, noticing that the, the, the feed, that the noise was coming through the amp, right. you know, when, when you've got the amp on, but you're not playing anything. So he's kind of got that bit of noise, like a crackling yeah. sound. So he's going like, so he's doing that. And then the, he did it like a few times and then, before he went into the next one, I just went dun dun like that, <laughs> and then both of us turned around. He was like, "Fuck, holy shit!" You know, like it was fucking screaming, like it was the fucking coolest moment ever. He was like, "No fucking way!" You know, and it was like, it was like a really cool fucking moment. You know, that that me and this guy had. You know, as like teenagers in Iran inside a fucking yeah, basement. Yeah. You know, but it's like that's that's the power of music, man. You know, like creating moments like that, which as an artist. So much of the time, you don't even get to see that. You don't even get to see or hear how it, those moments uh, translate. You know, you only get to see what's at a show or what someone might share with you. But it's it's how I think it is. There's a, there's a really powerful thing to how what you do. You know, a, a lot of times as an artist, it has so much effects around the world and these rip, ripple effects that yeah. perhaps you're not even aware of. The moment it leaves your stereo or, or whatever, then it somehow belongs to the world. And then yeah, yeah, it yeah. just it just happens. You know what I mean? How did you feel when that happened, though? Because out of all the songs in the world, he, he started playing that one. 
and you obviously knew the song and where you were situationed at, at the same time. But uh, what, like, what are the odds for that, really? It's fucking insane. It, it's, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so that, when when you think about it like that, and I've had, I don't know how many situations that when I've, everything has just been like leveled up to to that level you know and it's like yeah. no nah, that's not a coincidence that's not a coincidence and spent mm. many years of trying to figure out why is that happening and then now it's like it happens and and just fine with it you know yeah yeah, yeah before you're when right. i was younger i made a huge deal out of it. it's like i need to find the answer to why this is happening blah blah, blah. and then it's basically we're just like maybe we are just uh, frequencies just that's it, you know. It's like a radio. You, yeah, yeah. That's why sometimes you you close to somebody on the same frequency, they're still static, you know. But sometimes you get a clear sound, like oh, all right. So that's the clear sound type of things, you know. And yeah. to me, after that, that's why it's like in the interdimensional summit. It's like to the trained eye, there are no co coincidences. That's why it's to me that's there is no coincidence anywhere. <laughs> Listen, man, you're preaching to the choir right now. There's, there's, so, <laughs> <laughs> there's so much time I've, I've spent thinking about this, you know. I mean, just the fact that even you and I met, you know, I mean, what, what were the odds right. of that, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah. it's, uh, no, it's, it's just when you meet people and you, you're in situations where there's just like, yeah, the most natural thing in the world, then to me, that's mm. not a coincidence, you know. Sure. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's there's something there. There's um, what you said about the frequency. That's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, because it seems like the more you sort of follow your gut, the more you tune yourself. It's it's a tuning, you know, like you tune yourself to a certain layer within reality, and then mm -hmm. you just sort of move through it, and then. Yep you do the work and then all the stuff that you want to see happen just happens, yeah. you know? And then when it happens, you almost can't even overreact. You can just, you can only be neutral because that's the right thing that was supposed to happen. Does that make right. sense? Yes. Makes perfect like, sense. Like if In you my turn world, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Like if you almost like turn around and say, Oh my God, I can't believe this happened. Wow. The universe, this and that. When you react like that, it almost somehow just takes away from you for a second. Says, "Shut mm. up and fucking sit down." This yeah. is this is yeah. you know like calm the fuck down. You know, yeah. <laughs> you're supposed to like be okay about this and, and be normal. This is the path that you chose. So yeah. don't create, don't scramble the signal now that you're there. Exactly, you know? exactly. And then there's like sit down for a minute and listen to this song because there might be something you can get out of it. Most likely there is because that's the whole point why you being sat down and. Um, paying attention and and uh, and picking up what you're supposed to pick up from that situation you know so absolutely yeah but i think <laughs> one great thing about music in general is that it allows for those moments to become so much more prevalent. It, it allows for them to happen so much more often. You know, I mean, I remember, you know, I, by the way, I converted my mother into a metal head uh, with the intro for all Tid, just, just for. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Obviously it's just piano and then it's, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the speech bit, you know, and it's interesting when you actually read the lyrics, obviously she didn't understand Norwegian, you know, at that time. But uh, yeah, my mother was like 40 years old when I converted her into a metalhead you know and uh, and we both her and i actually saw you at bloodstock 2012 uh oh, wow. yeah 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 yeah. Cool. and uh and uh, we we the, so the first show that i came to by the way sorry a bit, bit of a tangent here but the first show that i came to was when you did the uh, enthroned darkness um shows in uh, two, 2011 you know i got to see you just before you got right. rid of the hair so uh oh, okay, so. <laughs> okay, okay yeah yeah, yeah and that, that was... went in 2012 yeah so that uh yeah we did um we did uh, a little bit of touring where we played the whole album 
Yeah, that's right. Um, and I saw yeah. you in Birmingham at the O2 Academy. I think it was right, like right, 25th, cool. 26th of November, 2011, just two months after I moved to the UK. So, And, and the oh, fact wow. that you didn't have any support bands was perfect because it was the first legit metal show I got to see. And uh, and you guys opened with Morning Palace. And if you go watch any of the bootleg videos, you can hear me screaming on the intro. Oh, <laughs> of, really? Like any okay. of the YouTube videos. Because <laughs> I was like, though. I always saw you guys on, like, this is, this is so cool about it you know is that you know this was something that for me it was a big deal you know because it was something that i always only saw on screens with bootleg dvds mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it was right in front of me something that i never thought i'd be able to see i never thought in my life i'd be able to see one live show one metal live show. i never thought i'd be able to see it so the fact so we that were the it first. was yeah you were yeah wow, cool. you, you guys popped the cherry if i may say <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah. one yeah yeah no that was, was... um that, that's uh it was the same for me when i was uh that was more of a local band i saw in 87 88 um mm -hmm. a band called fury uh and i'm still good friends with the the then drummer that is singing in another band now um but my first real big um show was Iron maiden in 1990 on Oof. um on the No Prayer for the Dying Tour. Nice. So for me to just see Maiden, you know, obviously that's not the, the album that stands out in their catalog, although they have a few uh, few cool ones on it, I have sure. to say. Um, but that was um, that was like a dream come true for me, you know, to see Maiden uh, in, in Norway. Uh, and that was also around the time where I was like looking at picking up an instrument. So it's, you know, uh, it was, yeah. Uh, I remember 8th of November, 1990. So every 8th of November, it's like, you know. That's, oh, that's uh, sick. Nice. You saw Death as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. First time in uh, 1992, was it? February 1992. I'm so fucking um, jealous. That was, <laughs> that was great. Uh, it was amazing. Um the first show that was like of of certain standard was Morbid Angel in uh, November nineteen ninety one. Right, they had, that's when they, they were had, dangerous. Morbid Angel. Yes, exactly. And they had uh, Unleashed and uh, Entombed uh, as support. And that Jesus. Was, and I remember I I hadn't even heard about Unleashed before, so it's the first time I get to hear Unleashed was was at that show and I, it just blew my mind from the get-go and then entombed obviously and then more nation finished and it was just one of those one of those shows that um just sticks to your mind and uh grateful to be be a part of you know is that when you kind of got the inspiration to pick up an uh, iron bird bc rich uh the no train. this was a little this was a little bit before that actually because i had a mockingbird uh and that i played on uh during that was i would say after the first album between the first and the second album i got hold of a mockingbird so that was my oh, no. first proper proper guitar before that i had like a regular shaped um i can't even remember what it was but it was some cheap uh cheap guitar so before before that my first instrument was bass obviously so yeah yeah um but i felt that i was like no nah, i have more to say you know early on i was like getting cocky and was like oh no i need to get it over guitar and uh, so some of the first riffs i even made on guitar was like uh, the intro riff for uh robion spider dragon and Scott okay bass. one of my first guitar riffs ever you know so uh that comes from from playing that really old uh guitar yeah yeah no that's really cool man you know that's that's another thing you know we were talking about objects earlier you know that's one thing that's that's so fucking cool about guitars is the is the memory that they have attached to them you know and all the years you know and the personality that you had at the time when you were using the guitar you know what i mean this is yeah, yeah. a powerful I mean, thing right there there are certain guitars i don't get rid of like uh, like my iron bird the mockingbird is gone now but the iron bird i still have and my my camel jackson for instance you know that was a beautiful guitar that is an amazing guitar it still sounds uh, and looks amazing and so there, there's certain items that uh, i have to be in in real danger without no money to, to get rid of <laughs> <laughs> 
Sure, I understand. No, that, that's that's great, man. That's great. I've I've still kept my guitars from from Iran. You know, there weren't many, but that Yamaha that I mentioned to you, I yeah, still yeah. have that over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. And it's like, and it's I still play it. You know, cause yeah, yeah. Even but it, though it, that's part of you, though. That's that's part of history. We can go through yeah. many different guitars and instruments over the years, but there, there's certain uh, things that are basically extensions of of what you are are and what you have become so it's it makes sense to keep some of it at least you know because it's it's you you know exactly and if i happen to pass away and someone mistreats my guitars i'm going to come back and eat their ass so that's yeah. uh, that's my attitude as well <laughs> 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 yeah absolutely man um listen brother what a fucking privilege it has been to have this chat with you i, I totally enjoyed it i feel like we could probably go on all day you know but uh, i think we've probably reached a point where we've we've covered a lot of like really good stuff that that we wanted to cover um, um uh, oh yeah just one one more memory as well i, I want to share with you is that um like I was talking about the thing of what music does is like one time my mother and I, when we were walking on the streets of Tehran and we saw a Saipa. Saipa is uh, is one of the uh, car manufacturers in, in Iran. It's, right. um, it, it's like the cheapest, shittest fucking car you can get. Like they're awful, you know, sometimes they just blow up for no reason. But, uh, but one time in particular, you know, um, we saw a white Saipa uh, they call it Pride. That was the name of the the that particular version of the car. It was Pride, and it was driving around, and on the back, on 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 the back, like the windshield of the car, it it had in giant stickers Dimi Borgir. Really? And I remember, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i remember showing my mom i was like mom look at that fuck it it says do we work here and we we're like what the fuck so it's like you can kind of see these random fucking things over there you know and that's the crazy thing of music no one will know what that guy or person will have uh you know like no but through. he knew so he he just probably yeah. laughed you know had a good time yeah yeah yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He got away with it too so it's <laughs> yeah and he awesome. probably would have never imagined that someone would have one day relayed that story to you right. you know and he probably yeah. will never find this or that out, you but, would like... recognize it you know it's, exactly uh, so exactly exactly so you know there's a there's, there's a powerful thing there you know let's call it the universal exchange that's what i'm going to call this episode as well so cool. uh yeah yeah uh, sven thank you so much for your time brother really really appreciate the chat and and the time and and the and the insight and the catharsis same here man thanks for the exchange <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> See, i can't fucking help it. <laughs> uh, you guys have you, you guys have uh took so much of the uh the vocabulary and dictionary um is there anything you would like to share with the listeners before um before we wrap this up uh well we, we touched upon it briefly about the next album and stuff and we are mm -hmm. uh, we're pretty far into the process uh obviously i cannot promise any any particular time frame at the moment, but next year we're going to be busy with uh, with a few one-off shows and festivals, and we're going to try and and start the recording process uh, in between somewhat. And uh, we have quite a lot of material, and it, it's sounding really varied, and uh, it has all the elements that is there for all the right reasons. And uh, so we're gonna. It's, I mean, we we have so much material that we could probably have uh made a double album if we wanted to perhaps sure. we will who knows you know and we have never done a double album so <laughs> who knows <laughs> right on that would be uh, but, cool um, but don't quote me on it uh but at least we, we're in 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 the great process at the moment and uh, we look forward to speed up uh a bit and um have it finalized uh early uh next year hopefully so and uh, yeah of course the uh cover album is out on um, December 8th so uh, for those of you who wants to update um, the audio uh, sound or whatever on some of the songs I mean some of them sounded great as they did in the past but uh, at least now we have every everything on one platter and and the volumes are adjusted and and everything has a new master so uh, it sounds great I think and uh I mean, if if you if you don't want it, that's fine as well. It's we've done this just as much for ourselves as we did for our dire plans. So it's basically there for someone 
who wants to pick it up or if they just want to stream it who knows who cares <laughs> <laughs> awesome man no, th- th- it sounded great i mean what you did for a puritanical uh, you know just, just with retouching some of the sounds and stuff on that it came out really really good you know uh and yeah i think, I think so uh, absolutely yeah 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 and it, it, like it's good you know like obviously the original is still sounded so fucking good uh for the time that it came out like there was really not many other albums at that time that sounded like that even not just black metal but like even within death metal as well there really wasn't anything else like that so mm-hmm. it was good that you kind of revisited it you know and you kind of get to i guess does the songs a little bit more justice so i guess the same applies to the to the covers as well you know uh once uh, once yeah, all except, of those uh, come out except none of the um, none of the cover songs are remixed but uh puritanical was remixed as well as remastered so sure that's uh but there's there's certain things on on puritanical album that was kind of way more hidden than we thought first when we listened to the tapes again you know it's like oh shit um so that's cool, you know. It's almost like when uh, when Metallica went through their Black album and they went through each uh, tracks, you know, because there were yeah. so many tracks on each song. And I was like, "Oh shit, did we do that? Who did that?" It's like it was almost on that level, you know. So it's always cool. And again, it's the same as as the as the cover album. You know, it's there for people who want to pick it up. There's no there's no gun to anyone's heads, you know. And uh, it's it's just a our way of celebrating the anniversary of of the album all although it came a bit too late because so the, the vinyl printing plants were way behind due to the scandemic as you said so um <laughs> but now it, it seems like it's back on track so hopefully when we get to record a new album that, that it should be back to normal when it comes to uh promotional time the the label needs and and stuff so we shouldn't be too far behind once once we send off the master amazing that that sounds excellent man you heard it here ladies and gentlemen sven one more time thank you so fucking much for joining me man i absolutely appreciate your time and to everyone else who's been listening to the podcast i hope you guys enjoyed this one keep an eye out for the cover album and beyond and then perhaps in the new album after that I'll speak to you guys on the next episode of Eblis Manifestations. Cheers.